As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 399, The First Battle of Ruisat Ridge. Last time, through a combination of bad reconnaissance reporting, getting misdirected in the sands of North Africa, and Auchinleck's determination to stand his ground, Rommel's forces ran into a wall. Truth be told, that wall was partially of his own making, and so the Desert Fox acknowledged that he had to go on the defensive. Thus, the Italian divisions were ordered to form a line just west of the El Alamein station. There, they would wait for reinforcements before another big push. But this is Rommel, so the attacks would go on, hopefully creating some bigger opportunity. Just before this stoppage of his, on July 2nd, the Axis found that their push in the north was held up by the artillery of the Indians. Their push on Ruisat Ridge was checked by the 1st Armored Division and the New Zealanders, with the 7th Motor Brigade not only stopping the Italians from coming any further south, but the New Zealanders had reached the El Mir Depression, about four miles north of their Kopanga position, while the 7th Motor Brigade actually managed to reach Fuca, about halfway between El Alamein and Tobruk. The tankers knew they could not stay, but had kept going because no one stopped them. And when they reached Fuca, the German pilots there panicked, not expecting to see enemy ground forces this close. Either way, Rommel had just been sent a message. We can get to you as well. Alas, for Auchinleck, General Gott did not have any reserves, so near the end of July 2nd, though the New Zealanders had made a hole, there was nothing left to feed into it. Thus, Rommel's supply lines had been saved. But the Axis general had no intention of simply waiting behind his lines for reinforcements to arrive, so he could start up his offensive again. No, he would lay the groundwork by doing what he did best find a chink in the enemy's armor, and exploit it. And that chink, at this moment, were the New Zealand forces at the Mir Depression. As covered last time, he would use the enemy's advance there to his advantage by isolating and then destroying it, which is why he asked Kesselring for more guns, specifically 88s. The way things stood, Rommel had a bulge in his line with the most eastern portion of it, sticking out right below the El Alamein perimeter. As such, and this was standard, Auchinleck wanted the New Zealanders and other GOT units to push north, which would not only break up Rommel's line, but also isolate the easternmost part of the Axis forces within the bulge. Those trapped men could either surrender or be destroyed. See episode cover. Problem was, this move, which had been done thousands of times before this and would be done thousands more after, was too obvious. Rommel prepared his men for it, but first the reinforcements started flowing in. Kesselring, for all of his annoyance at Rommel, could see that the man was actually accomplishing something. It's just that he did not pull along with the team. But the German CNC wanted needed to support this man at this moment. So Kesselring flew in the 164th Light Africa Division. They flew in from nearby Crete and landed at Tobruk. That position was already starting to pay dividends. Also, the Ramp Parachute Brigade, a Luftwaffe parachute unit, was flown in, commanded by Major General Hermann Bernhard Ramp. Rome, matching this, if anything, to keep the enemy far away from Italian territory further west, sent over the Frigore Parachute Division and the Pistoa and Frivoli Infantry Divisions. Matching this, Auchinleck had Morrishead's 9th Australian Division come over from Syria. 
whereas the 5th Indian Division was already in the area, so the CNC had it strengthened to three brigades. As for the other units already near El Alamein, the CNC had more artillery and tank units added to them. And finally, news had come that the 8th Armored Division had just landed at Suez and was estimated to reach Auchinleck by June 15th. Thus, both sides bulked up for the next major slugfest. But before that happened, Rommel moved forward with his smaller jabs. And yet, Auchinleck, while having ideas that would benefit 8th Army in the future with a more organized and mobile approach to desert warfare, was still making one major mistake. Yes, his forces were building up nicely, and they would probably do well in the near future. But the CNC was not focused on the probably, but certainly was zeroed in on the immediate future. Through his messages to various commanders, it's easy to tell that he was more concerned with pushing Rommel and Africa Corps back to Fuca versus getting his enemy to the point where they would need to retreat to Fuca. In other words, he was putting the cart before the horse, or in this case, the great advance before the breakthrough. Auchinleck's first attempt, now that the battle line was more solid, started on July 5th, when he had the New Zealanders and Gott's tanks try to push north. But for all the reinforcements coming to the Allies, Auchinleck wasn't waiting, which most of his staff thought he should do. But perhaps the CNC thought he was being clever by taking a page from Rommel's book, namely rushing ahead without being fully prepared. But the CNC staff could have said, how many times did Rommel have to retreat before getting to this moment? How many men had he lost? And supplies. And Churchill was known for sacking generals who did not produce. In summation, don't move until you are ready and keep what you kill. You'll find yourself employed a lot longer if you do. Nevertheless, Auchinleck was confident that this would work, even if no one around him was. As the New Zealanders moved out, their official history spoke of how exhausted they were and that they were now an army of shreds and patches, but were still expected to test and best the men of Africa Corps. As the New Zealanders were knackered, the Axis forces opposing them had little trouble in checking their advance. This went on for two days, with little to show for it for the Allies. But there were two changes made over these two days. First, by July 7th, Auchinleck was giving up on Gott. And two, the constant fighting for 48 hours drew Rommel's armor ever more to the south as a safety measure. Auchinleck saw this shift in the panzers and decided he would take advantage of it. As Ramsden had taken over 30th Corps from Nori, the CNC ordered the former to use the freshly arrived 9th Australian Division and the 1st South African Division to move in a south or southwesterly direction from the Alamein Station near the coast. Respectfully, the 9th Australian was to make for Tel El Isa due west of the station, while the 1st South African Division made for Tel El Mach Cod closer to the Alamein perimeter, and so to the southeast of Tel El Isa. Again, see the cover. The idea was for these two forces, once they cleared the defenders in their respective target areas, to get in behind the panzers, who were further south at this point, dealing with or keeping an eye on the New Zealanders. Auchinleck told his staff that this had a solid chance of succeeding as the target forces about to get hit were the Sabrathra and Trento divisions. A few days were needed to get the men in place, but the big push was scheduled for July 10th at 3.30 a.m. But what was about to happen was a case of, Aha! I've got him! Oh crap! I've just been gotten! Rommel's panzers, edging their way south, wasn't just to keep the New Zealanders in check. Rommel had learned a long time ago how to accomplish two things with one move, or how to turn a problem into a solution, or rather, how to take your problem 
and make it a problem for the enemy. As the panzers were heading south, Rommel decided to go all in and attack in the south, as if the inaction was just too much for him to bear. But more than impatience, Rommel was still looking for a passageway around Auchinleck's defensive line. And reports of this attack started to reach the CNC. To his credit, Auchinleck had been at this long enough to recognize a Rommel sleight of hand. So ordered the New Zealanders and Gott to pull back, to even give up their hard-won gains. In fact, the Kopanga box, as well as the Nab Abu Duis box to the southwest of Kopanga, just above the massive Katara Depression, were to be abandoned in order to establish a stronger defensive line that Rommel could smash his panzers on all he wanted. But the Desert Fox saw this pullback and equally had the measure of Auchinleck. So when Gott and the Kiwis started pulling back, Rommel followed them with the 21st Panzer and the Littorio Divisions on July 9th, one day before Auchinleck's big northern push was to get underway. And now that a crack appeared in the south, Rommel had the 90th Light and the reconnaissance units head east as well, searching for a way to do an end run around Auchinleck's southern flank without going into the massive depression to the south. Watching these units head out, Rommel was probably hopeful that they would find something. That is, until he heard the sound of gunfire to his north. Rommel realized he had just been outfoxed, and so ordered back his mobile units. They now needed to accompany him to the north to put out whatever fire the enemy had started. And it was fortuitous that he brought his panzers with him because his northern half was practically falling apart. When the Australians and South Africans headed out, in their way was the Sabathra Division. That entity now, after a few hours of shelling, which nearby Germans said was worse than in World War I, had all but collapsed. If it had not been for von Melithen grabbing up some men, tanks, and guns from the Panzer Army headquarters— along with the newly arrived 164th Light Africa Division, the Sabratha's destruction would have been complete. Still, both the Australians and South Africans were successful in taking their respective targets, namely, again, Tel El Isa and Tel El Mak Khan Ridge. And that had been while repulsing continuous, but not overwhelming, Axis counterattacks. Rommel's men truly were worn down. This was not their best, but it was happening. The German counterattacks went on day after day until July 14th, when Auchinleck launched his next surprise. For the last few days, Auchinleck was getting reports of Rommel moving more and more of his armor to check the Australians and South Africans. So he got the idea to hit the enemy in the center namely the Pavia and Brescia divisions. And as the panzers had to be running low on fuel and ammunition, what, having rushed north and gone straight into the fighting, they would be unlikely or unable to help. Remembering that Rommel's line had a bulge in it, the most easterly edge was near the Ruisat Ridge, when Rommel and his panzers came charging north, the Italians used that momentum to obtain the western edge of Ruisat Ridge, but now Auchinleck wanted them off. But more than that, he was trying to duplicate some of the greatest successes of Alexander the Great, Caesar, and Napoleon by namely splitting Rommel's defensive line in the center. For then, each flank would be without support. It was a dangerous move, but with those panzers further north and west, this could work. Auchinleck ordered Gott to use the 5th Indian and 2nd New Zealand divisions to attack the ridge, but at night, this was to be a silent attack, one favored by the New Zealanders. But that also meant that there would be no pre-attack artillery barrage. Still, the guns were put on notice to be ready, should things not go well. But the New Zealanders, getting a little tired of British control and execution, or the lack thereof, 
gave a stern warning about friendly fire and thus prepared pre-programmed coordinates. This left the 1st Armored Division to protect the attacker's southern flank, but once the ridge was theirs again, a sign that the Pavia and Brescia divisions had been mauled, the 1st Armored was then to swing northwestwards again, trying to cut off Rommel's supply line. In a word, the attack started off as a great success. It did not end that way. During the dark early hours of July 14th, the New Zealanders and Indians went all before them on the ridge. Problem was, they could not see everything out there due to the darkness, like the 20 panzers hunkered down for the night. Again, see episode cover. Still, by sunrise, the Pavia and Brescia divisions had all but given way, now becoming disorganized in the extreme. A few German infantry positions were overrun, but the men were not completely wiped out or captured. And being professional themselves, when the Allies went by them, the Germans regrouped, which would cause headaches for the New Zealanders. But then the sun rose, and with the coming light, the fortunes of the two sides on the ridge were exchanged. Now that they had light, those 20 panzers ran into the rear of the New Zealanders, who were not only caught off guard, but had no anti-tank weapons as the recovering German infantry intercepted the weapons en route. As such, 350 New Zealanders were captured before the 1st Armored Division could rush up and help. There was also the 22nd Armored Brigade who could have helped the Kiwis, but communication problems prevented this. By the time they did show up, 4 p.m., to help the still-fighting New Zealanders, it was too late. Those men were saved, but their captured comrades had already been taken away. When Rommel heard of the two collapsed Italian divisions, his first thought went to his now vulnerable center. There was nothing for it but to counterattack. So Rommel took bits from his three mobile divisions and gave them to General Walther Nehring, commander of the Africa Corps, and told him to take back that ridge. That same afternoon, July 14th, at 5 p.m., Nehring's counterattack got underway. First, the Panzers ran into the 4th New Zealand Brigade, who were forced to scatter. The British tanks tried to rescue the situation, but again, got there too late. But it got worse for the 4th New Zealand. Not only were another 380 of them taken prisoner, but the rest were forced off of Ruisat Ridge. Later that evening, the 22nd Armor Brigade finally stopped General Nehring, whose men were getting tired. The next day, July 15th, Nehring tried again, twice, but was held up, as the defenders had consolidated their part of the ridge. And during all this... Auchinleck's supposed big attack in the north amounted to very little and was itself stopped before going too far. As the sun set on July 16th, the first battle of Ruisat Ridge was over, now a part of history. Meanwhile, the wider war had the temerity to stick its nose in Auchinleck's business. With the Germans on the eastern front, heading for the Caucasus oil fields, and still trying to get into the Middle East in general. The collective CNCs were asking London, what was the priority? Persia, i.e. Iran, and Syria, or Egypt? Because the way things were looking, Rommel, though temporarily checked, was doing some checking of his own, as this last limited victory showed. There was still a chance the Germans and Italians may end up in or even past Egypt by the fall. What, again, was their priority? All were asking Churchill. The Prime Minister, now very upset with Auchinleck and his lack of success, messaged the CNC. It was for his eyes only and biting. Quote, The only way in which a sufficient army can be gathered in the Northern Theater is by your defeating or destroying General Rommel and driving him at least a safe distance. 
So even though his men were beyond exhausted, and the New Zealanders were looking sideways at the British leadership, Auchinleck knew he had to, once more, ask something of these men. At least, he could read, mostly, the cards in Rommel's hand, thanks to Bletchley Park. It would have to be enough. <laughs> 